Hello and welcome back to another Adobe Live. As always, we're here on our lunch break on Behance from 12 to 1. And today we have my wonderful co-host, Stephanie. How are you, Stephanie? I'm good. How are you, Emma? Very well. Happy Tuesday, everyone. And we're joined as well by the fantastic Joe Allen, who describes himself Hello. as being a content creator. Um, but you're so much more than that creatively to my eyes as well. So, Joe, I'm looking forward to hearing about your process and projects today. Um, just before that, remember everyone that this is your time to really ask away all the questions you want. And yeah, just not just when you'd like to hear more of something. So for now, Joe, please introduce yourself. Let us know where you're based and what you'll be sharing today. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Joe Allen. I'm, uh, I guess, an independent creative of sorts. Um, mainly what I do is, is based around travel photography. Um, but I share a lot of that through video. Um, so I kind of post a lot of my work on YouTube, um, kind of focusing on creating the, the storytelling, the narrative um, through filmmaking about my photography. But my background is actually in design. Um, so I have a um, history in working on design and I've been doing photography the last... Uh, 13, 14 years, something like that. Um, but I've been uh, kind of, I guess, the content creator side of things for the last five and a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I don't know when I'll next be able to travel again, but um, for the moment, I've been doing a lot of admin based and working a lot of things from home. Um, and uh, today I'm going to share through some of the kind of like workflow side of things, because um, I think that's one of the uh, one of the most overlooked areas of creative work. So often it's kind of assumes that you have this sort of footage or imagery uh, to work with, and then you miss those steps of how you actually kind of uh, best organize yourself and invest in yourself for efficiency. So those are some of the things I want to share with you today in um, Premiere, some of my file management, and um, after effects as well, and just ways of thinking about things in an efficient manner, hopefully. And where are you based? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> where exactly are you based? Uh, so I'm in London. Um, yeah, so I spend uh, probably about half the year um, in London, and the rest of the year I'm, I'm out traveling in places. Um, a large portion of that I spend in Japan, and uh, that's kind of also become a bit of a um, like a running theme on my channel. Uh, I'd say about half of the videos on the channel are based in Japan as well. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's such a photogenic place. Um, and I, I'm probably going to talk a lot about Japan. In fact, some of the projects I've got in here that I'm going to show are Japan based. So yeah. we have a lot to of have a lot of theme. Yeah, uh, Japan seems to keep on coming up. But yeah, we have <laughs> yeah. everyone who's also um, joining in the chat. Go ahead, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, all, all around the UK, mm. we have Devon, yeah. Sussex, London, Sheffield, uh, Glasgow, and apparently it's not raining in Glasgow. It is raining in London, <laughs> clearly. It is, yeah. Today, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of nice to have the rain, actually. It, um, it feels like it hasn't rained in like weeks, A long it time. seems. Yeah. And what's that, like four minutes into the stream? We're already talking about the weather. <laughs> great typical typical i love this <laughs> but i think we're justifying being at home now and we don't need to go outside anymore so it's great having yeah. the rain for once um but you were actually meant to travel today you were telling me that you had a trip planned right joe yeah the, i was actually i was supposed to be coming back from japan today um and i got my notification yesterday um telling me uh make sure you leave by this time to arrive at the airport and i just saw it and thought Oh, <laughs> we're broken. I know we're all getting yeah. those emails reminding us where we should be. Or the worst is those memories that you get from like a year back on your Instagram yeah. and you're thinking, yeah, that's what I was doing. <laughs> this is where I was. Yeah. Um, but where does the whole fascination with Japan come from and what kind of drew you to going there? How many um, times have you been? I mean, it seems like you're um, spending a lot of time there as well, which is nice. <laughs> so I think I've, I've always had um, like a fascination to Japan, I'm I'm quite a big tech head, so I've I've always loved technology and just kind of seeing um, kind of like you know how the industry is moving and the camera industry is, is pretty much ninety five percent based from Japan. Um, 
my partner Ellie, uh, she is Japanese. We met in London, um, and the very first time I went to Japan was with her. Um, and then from then onwards, it was just this. I guess it, I I kind of describe it as like the inside track because obviously we go to Japan. We've um, you know all her family are from there, so we can spend time and um, kind of really live the local life immediately. And it's become a very sort of um, easy way of traveling because it's taking the advantages of um, having that Japanese family as a side, but also seeing it from my perspective, which was completely new to the culture and the country. Um, and together, both of us as photographers, we're kind of just always endlessly inspired um, and it's just got to the point now where we visit for uh, sometimes a few months at a time. Um, usually it's for a number of weeks. Um, and I think I've been maybe about 14 times or something now. Um, oh, brilliant. In, yeah, the last five years. So six years even. Brilliant. I'm, I'm just really want to go now. This is great. <laughs> Advertising yeah, it's... Well. <laughs> um, I, I recommend us, it so much. Can you show us some pictures from Japan, maybe? Or is that included in your project today as well? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, I do have some sample images. Uh, I don't know if any of these are they're not specifically categorized in Japan, but I don't know if my screen is showing. Yep. Uh, yep. So I'm just going to show these on quick view. Um, but yeah, the, the types of images that I love to capture are just kind of like the everyday scenes. Um, so I just really love, uh, I'm drawn to urban sort of um, locations a lot. I do love to explore some of the nature. Um, and I, I found myself over my years of doing photography that I've always kind of fluctuated between all these different genres um, just as a way of learning how they work and stuff. But over the last few years, I've definitely been drawn so much to the sort of urban side of things. Um, so these are just a collection of images over the last couple of years. Um, of course, the food scene in Japan is incredible. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the one of the one of the things that I really love, um, especially in the cities, um, so Tokyo and Osaka in particular, is the nightlife. But just the night every day, if that makes sense. The fact that everywhere's so well illuminated, um, it just makes photography so enjoyable. And usually I don't get to do nighttime photography um, that often, but in Japan, it's almost my go-to. I spend more time in the evenings and night out shooting. Um, do you and, use uh, specific lenses for at night? Uh, Yes, uh, to an extent. Um, they're the same lenses I use during the day, but uh, they are they do perform well in, at night. Um, so I use prime lenses. Uh, so I shoot with the Fujifilm system. So the 35mm f2 is uh, my main sort of go-to lens. Um, it's super portable. It's weather sealed, so it's it's great if it starts raining. Um, and I love shooting in the rain as well. That's another sort of favorite aspect of mine. Um, but yeah, that wide aperture really helps with the uh, the nighttime sort of scenes. Uh, that's not actually Tokyo; that is Paris. <laughs> We're jumping. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the the things that I do love about um, Japan is the fact that it's so easily accessible to travel almost anywhere in the country. So the rail network, um, I'm a huge fan of the trains there, is just incredible you can you can explore so much um and into the mountains and the nature side of things um and within like an hour or two you can be back in the dense sort of metropolis of tokyo um yeah it's Brilliant. cool and Sand so. sandrine is also asking in the chat if it helps having a native as well to, with ellie to be able to explore you know places that you wouldn't have gone to and i guess bringing you back as well to discover more yeah um it definitely helps, but it's, it's by no means necessary. Um, I mm. think the way that it, it kind of uh, 
kind of helps is we're able to potentially do more things in less time. Um, so like my Japanese language is, is very, very minimal. Um, but I can get by by myself. Um, and I can, I can go about the day fine, but having someone who does speak Japanese does, does definitely have an impact on planning. Um, but it, it's by no means a, a necessary thing. There's so much information available um, and Japan itself, the tourism has, I think it's like doubled every year for the last four or five years. Um, so it, it's a huge sort of community online of information. Um, yeah, it's, you can definitely get by. Um, and that's part of the adventure and the experience as well, going somewhere that times when you really don't know what's happening and the culture is wildly different to what you've grown up with. Um, that's just the best way to throw yourself in and learn about how the world lives because it's, it's wide, you know? Yeah, definitely. And in terms of your actual creation process, how did you find going into this kind of freelance life and having, I guess, freedom is really important to you, right? Because you can go back to Japan and have this adventure and, and create so much, but um, how did that, you, did you navigate this at the beginning and how did you get into this, this world, right? Of, of managing your own life. And, and um, yeah. I guess it's very idealistic <laughs> from our standpoint, but I'm sure people will be wondering how they can also um, you know, have a similar lifestyle. Yeah, that's, um, I get asked that a lot, actually. It's, um, mm. It's by no means uh, an overnight, like easy thing. Um, so, as I said, my background is in design, and um, when I graduated and was working, uh, I guess my first sort of like office design job and in places, I very quickly realised that it wasn't the it wasn't a long term plan of mine. Um, like I definitely had a lot of um, a lot of aspiration with my design work, but with photography always being on the side as like a, a sort of hobby and like a weekend and evening project and um, doing other things. I just, I hated sitting at a desk for hours on end um, and the the routine, the, the Monday to Friday, I just really struggled with that concept. I'm also a night person. So, um, the early mornings just didn't sit well with me, the commuting. Um, so I think internally going for that freelance life was this inner drive. Um, and I found myself watching a lot of other people on YouTube. This was around the 2011 mark. Um, and just really seeing it as a platform and seeing people talking about cameras and, and other stuff. And I thought, well, I can do that. Like I can talk about cameras and I want to, go to places and share some things and I want to I want to be a photographer I want to build um build myself up to be hired for these things so I started my channel and really started focusing on pushing um at the time it was my blog I'd been writing a blog for about eight years and I don't think anyone read it <laughs> I was just posting whatever um so I just really tried to push things out uh in the hopes that if I make myself known online as a photographer hopefully I can be hired for it. And likewise with my design work. And um, as my sort of like evenings and weekends were consistently taken up with building my website and building my channel out and doing all these things, eventually it got to a point in my last full-time job where I just thought, I, I can't sustain this. I can't do it anymore. I'd, I'd reached that tipping point of not wanting to progress any further in a full-time position and now is the time to take a leap um, and that took about two or three years I guess of of continuous um, like evening and weekend stuff um, and then it was a, a huge setback financially of okay well now I've got nothing I went freelance with my design work and started working on freelance projects and essentially still ended up working in offices but for short-term contracts and having those deadlines really helped um, and then eventually when, uh, we went traveling in 2016, I just kind of made a, a promise to myself that when I come back, I'm not going to work in an office again. Um, and halfway through traveling, we ended up to making the channel sustainable and yeah, it's, it's been a long process. Um, still by no means 
anywhere near back to the wage I was on when I had a job, but happiness levels are, are through the roof. So we actually have a question uh, that complements that. Chucky is asking, is it okay to ask how photographers make their living, commissions or project work or licensing their work or something else? Yeah, no, it's um it's a very common sort of thing. I think anything within creative um creative art is is difficult to monetize because as creatives we're always so passionate and that in my eyes is where the best art comes from um and when you're passionate about something your last focus is making money you you kind of you just want to make art and you have to remind yourself that in order to make more art you do need to make money um so uh with the model that i use um so i do work on uh sponsorship stuff with content that i put out um sometimes and one of the projects i'm going to share with you today uh that was a commissioned piece by a tourism board um so working with i prefer to work on bigger projects um for a bigger uh sort of budget and do less of them throughout the year so that way I'm still able to set most of my year to dedicating to my own art and to make my own work um, and to do my own travel and then just monetize the big projects um, a few times throughout the year. You could take an approach of doing lots of smaller budget work um, and there's definitely more of it out there to, to uh, come across your plate, but I try not to fall into that trap of where if I take one project and it covers me enough for say two weeks and then it takes me two weeks to kind of do it or I find myself taking a week to do it and then another week finding more work, you very quickly get into a cycle of never making anything for yourself. You're always making for someone else. Um, and to me, I find that a dangerous territory. I'd, I'd want to always dedicate at least half of my time to be working on things for me um so that's kind of my approach on it but there's so many different um revenue streams you can work with and the internet has made so much of it more global as well there's an audience in multiple languages across multiple regions um and yeah there's, you can i think the the best place to start is to is to watch and just analyze how other people are doing it rather than just looking at it saying like, like, Oh, they're, you know, they're able to do this because of this. It's like, well, how did they get to there? How did they get that? How did someone find them? You need to make yourself approachable and found. Um, and again, it's, it doesn't come easy. It just takes a long, long time. Um, and I'm by no means there. It's, uh, it's a long path ahead on where I'd like to be on things. Um, and I don't think I'll ever reach it, to be honest. It's the goalposts are always moving. But yeah, and I mean, it, you're going to have to dig out that blog as well, Joe, <laughs> from yeah, eight well, years back. Or <laughs> yeah. Is it really? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's still my main blog. I mean, for a, oh. <laughs> for a good few years, I was posting weekly. Um, and then uh, when uh, my channel sort of like kicked off, that's when yeah. um, I didn't post as frequently. But you never yeah. know. It's nice having having those <laughs> memories, though. There's a few things in there that I saw uh, a few weeks back that I'd written as like goals for the future, and one of them was going to Adobe Max. Um, and then a couple of years, no, I think actually maybe it's about six years later, I then eventually went to Adobe Max, and I was like, oh, I didn't realize I'd had this such a as a goal for so long. But yeah, nice. So should we dig into some projects as well and see what you have to yes. share? um okay do you prefer taking pictures of architecture landscape or people is there any trend in your work um i will be completely honest and say i'm not very good at uh photographing people um it's an area that i really want to improve um yeah i've just i've never been able to have that that same sort of interaction with people when there's a camera um in the way when i see portrait photographers that that can get um those types of images where you really get to know a person i'm in huge admiration for them um 
so yeah, I, I focus more on the the sort of scenes, um, and I, I prefer a more sort of candid approach of of looking at urban um, locations or uh, sort of huge landscapes of nature and, and things like that. But mostly it is urban architecture, and I am drawn to architectural design for sure. Let's show us something. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, so I'll do a, a quick run through. One of the one of the things that I think is is very, um, I guess, overlooked uh, in a lot of things is how you actually set up a um, a project from the start. Because a lot of people they assume that you've got all of this footage. So I I live by a method of dry, which is uh, DIY. Don't repeat yourself. Um, it kind of comes from this. Uh, I guess like a web development side of things where some people can overlook efficiency as being lazy and trying to find the the quick route. Um, but, and I was talking with my friend yesterday about this and he, he worded it perfectly. He described it as the, the efficiency levels that I go to on things, they are, they're an investment. Um, and I take so much time in, setting things up that I know I'm going to repeat and I think it's totally worth it. So from the start, and this can be is what may seem boring of just file management, but I honestly think doing these types of things really helps you focus on your creativity because you don't have to worry about them. So for example, if we're, I don't know if my screen is showing at the moment. Uh, yeah, is all it? Good. yeah, it looks like it. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, I love to just create templates of things. So I've just got a template folder structure here. And essentially what I would do is I would just duplicate that and rename it to what my current project is. And then within this folder structure, everything is organized and it's been mostly the same for the last four years. So no matter what, I can always grab a project and I just know that everything is going to be referenced. All of my files are going to be accessible um, and I can keep them on a server somewhere and just drag them off when I need them. So I can then go into my source video and I've got here all the different cameras that I may use um, during a production. And again, I can just duplicate and rename it to today's reverse date um, and then whatever I want to call it. And from there, I can drop in all of my footage um, and everything's all nice, neat and organized. Likewise, the same with audio. And it's just by having these things enabled so that there's as little friction as possible when it comes to setting up a project. And that goes all the way down into actually having a template Premiere file, which if we open up, um, I've got it open here. This is a, uh, let's just open the timeline. Yeah, so this is a completely blank project that I start with. Um, but again, everything's ready to go. So if I just finished a shoot and I brought in my footage, I can drop it in uh, into my source video bin over here on the left. And from there, my footage can go straight into a timeline. I've already got a sequence ready to be renamed. Um, so I can call this one, say, Adobe V1. So my sequence is already here, ready to be renamed, and I can drop footage in. The sequence is set up to my usual settings um, for how I do my uh, my videos on my channel. Within here, everything is all labeled and titled. And I find these little tips and adjustments are things that a lot of people just never really pay attention to. And um, it also helps with consistency. And um, I think if you're, like when people ask about how do you build a, um, you know, a career out of this or something, consistency on quality and style, I think goes a, a really long way. Um, so my timeline here, I've got my titles all ready to go. Um, and I'm going to share some uh, things in After Effects in a moment of how I make some of my titles. And uh, again, they're just there. If we play that, title is just ready. Um, and I can drop these in. Likewise, when I share my photos in uh, my videos, my templates here, and it's literally a case of just dragging and dropping a photo in. Um, 
And second to that is all of my audio processing that I generally use. I've applied, uh, if you open the audio track mixer, this is a window that um, I think gets overlooked quite a lot. Um, I first started doing this method of processing my audio. Essentially, you you process audio per track, so per sort of layer in your timeline, rather than doing it clip by clip. So for example, when I drop in some footage, um, so if we go to an existing video, so when I drop in some of my footage, I quite often keep all of the audio that is of the same style of narrative. So if that's me talking to camera, I'll keep it on the same track layer. And then I can add in my graphic EQ and I can just do all my processing that raises the um, various points that improve the vocal audio. I set a hard limiter so you never actually get any of the audio clipping. Um, so the, the levels are always maintained. And then I've also got the loudness um, radar here. And this is set to, uh, I believe it was, yeah, minus 13, um, which depends on where you're publishing, but this is what YouTube um, recommend in their settings. If you're going to broadcast, um, it can be as, I think, minus 24, I believe. Um, but these just mean that you have a, um, a localized audio across the platform. So that way you fit in um, across everyone's video. So if you ever find that when you're you're watching your video and then you go to someone else's and you constantly have to change the audio because their video is louder, yours is quieter and, and things like that. If everyone set their loudness radar, we would have a very comfortable experience online. So that's uh, just another thing I add in. There's um, someone in the chat who's asking a question already. Um, Gift is saying, does it mean you always shoot the same size in terms of video size since you use one project? Um, yes and no. Um, so I shoot uh, in the camera. It all comes out uh, 16 by 9, but I publish in 2 to 1 uh, for my channel. But at any time, I can change my sequence um, uh, resolution to something different. So likewise, I have a template in here um, if I open up in my sequence bin. So I've got one here that's set up for my stories, for example. Uh, and this is a vertical video format if I wanted to publish something specific for my stories on Instagram. And I've got one here in Facebook, which is uh, purely 16 by 9. There was a time, I'm not sure if it's still true, I haven't actually published to Facebook in a long time. But you could only do 16 by 9 in Facebook, I think. Um, that may not be the case now. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I do keep it very consistent. I've been shooting or publishing two to one for, uh, I think, over a year and a half now or something. Um, I just find it's the optimum aspect ratio for people on desktop, which are usually 16 by 9, or if it's a Mac, it's 16 by 10. Um, or TV, but likewise on a smartphone, especially some of the larger devices, they have a, a much longer um, screen size and uh, it's the optimum viewing between them. Uh, Cause I think about 50% of my audience do actually watch on mobile. So kind of catering to those. And I think artistically it's, it's quite nice to see a, a wider format. Which, which social media platforms would you say are the most important ones for a photographer? Um, I, I really do stand by YouTube. Um, for me, the biggest turning point in, in getting my work seen was YouTube. Um, people love video. Um, I mean, I found it in myself that I was watching so much video and I actually do think it's one of the best places to show your photography because it gives you that opportunity to talk through your work at the same time as showing it. Um, and as much as, you know, we, we write things and we, um, you know, we can describe things in written work, you have to be honest that a lot of people skim it. They don't, they don't take it in as, um, as well. So if you wanted to explain your work and, and show yourself as a photographer and, and show the location, um, I think video is by far the best place and YouTube have a monopoly on on being the the best place for that um 
Instagram is a is a great platform for um, for showing your photography and and keeping up to date very quickly. Uh, if you wanted to show, say, like a portfolio of work, it's maybe not the most professional place. Um, it's not necessarily judged as having, um, you know, it's bad to show your work on Instagram, for example. Uh, I think it's pretty, pretty comfortable for people. But if you can share it on um, something that prioritizes a bigger viewing platform, whether that's, say, um, Behance or Flickr or um, 500 Picks or something like that, it's a good opportunity. However, I will say you're probably not going to get the, the audience on it as you would with Instagram. Um, yeah, I, YouTube for me is is still my favorite place to consume even things like photography. Um, but you're actually yeah, sure. never you're actually never recording video files as such. You take pictures and then you add the pictures to a video. Yeah, yeah. So I um, I'm pretty much always traveling uh, when I'm making my vlogs. Um, I'll always be using two cameras. So one will be my video camera. Um, which is the Panasonic GH5. And then I will have my Fuji for um, photography. And it makes it easier on a mindset side of things because I can just switch between. So I can have one for video and it's got the microphone and everything. And when using it, that muscle memory is there for video. And then switching to photography. Um, and that's those are the stills that I share in my videos. Um, some people have thought that they are frames from the videos, but they're not. They're, they're completely separate photos. And what software do you use for um, post-editing? Do you start in Lightroom and then move over to Photoshop? Or do you jump straight into Photoshop or anything else? Uh, I use Lightroom uh, pretty much 100% for my photo editing. Um, I very rarely do any um, compositing or... Uh, sort of retouch work that's that requires Photoshop these days. Um, I used to use Photoshop for all of my images and um, organize my images in uh, other software and ended up getting into Lightroom, but still didn't edit with it until I think it was about 2014 or something. And then when I fully embraced Lightroom for um, processing my raw files, then I had no need to use Photoshop for for doing any of my photography work. Um, I still use Photoshop on a daily basis, but that's more for creating assets and design work. Um, but yeah, it's all, all Lightroom based. And do you use it on your desktop or do you also use the mobile version? Uh, yeah, so I do synchronize some of my libraries um, from... Uh, from the desktop, I synchronize them on Lightroom CC to my iPad, and I love editing on the iPad. There's still some some frustrations on how things um, can be organized. So from the import process, um, I don't import into Lightroom Mobile. I import into the desktop classic version. But in terms of editing and, and going through everything, Editing on the iPad is such a dream. Um, and if you put on some good music, and I found myself editing on planes quite a lot because it, it's such a, a tight space and using the pencil. Um, and in particular, one area that I really love is you can switch the interface to left-handed. So having all of the controls and everything on the left is so useful for me with the pencil. Um, and yeah, if, if the music's good and I'm just kind of getting into the the flow of things, um, I can reel through so many edits and it's rapid on the iPad. It's really, really lean. I've never actually tried um, the iPad. That's great. It's a great shout. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's really it. good. And the screen is beautiful. Like the, the quality of the, the images when, um, when you look at them in the iPad, I'm, yeah, I'm blown away by it every single time. I just use it on my mobile, but uh, I Me am too, the same yeah. as you. I'm always on the plane and then editing the pictures. But I take them with mobile because in, in your mobile app in Lightroom, you can take the raw format, right? So mm -hmm. obviously not yeah. as high quality as your pictures, but when, you are, <laughs> when you're just doing it for a hobby, not for a living, then I think it's, it's a great alternative to your normal uh, phone camera um, that gives yeah, you better quality and uh, yeah, helps to 
to be able to edit also on a plane and stuff. It's it's yeah. again not as big as an iPad screen, but it's like yeah, for just holiday snapshots and stuff, it's it's great. Yeah, it's I mean, I'd argue the quality can quite often be better than a camera. Um because you are often able to get the shots that your camera would have been otherwise away from. And if your camera's away, then you don't get the shot anyway. Um, but yeah, the, the quality of um, smartphones is amazing these days. It's really, really good. And I feel like we say that every year, and we have done for the last few years in particular. But this year in particular, it just blows me away. It's so good. Can you maybe show us... Uh a picture in Lightroom and show us what you did before and how it looks after or something? Uh, yeah, I can do. Um, We're going back to the process now. Yeah, I do that all the time. <laughs> whenever, the, I explain, the, yeah. <laughs> whenever I explain my friends on, on holiday, like how, the, you know, how I edited this picture, I always just pr long press with the finger on it and then you see how it was before, you know, and then when you love it. your finger, then you see what, <laughs> what you have done in Lightroom and everyone is like, wow. <laughs> magic <laughs> yeah I, i love that feature all the time it's just like yep. the long press and you see oh yeah this is what it was before and yeah <laughs> so basically do that joe please <laughs> you want the long press yeah. version <laughs> i i really uh, want to see it yeah <laughs> let me show like you <laughs> um let me just hide this behind so it's a bit cleaner so My most recent trip uh, was to Morocco. Very nice. <laughs> Why is this only... Interesting. I don't know, let me just check. We have some I've questions opened. if you want. <laughs> Stuart is asking, what photo adjustments do you create once you import an image into Lightroom? Curves, color adjustments. Uh, yeah, I do um, pretty much all adjustments on things. Um, my uh, tone curve is probably the the most sort of control um, you have in terms of like a character of an image. Um, oddly, my Lightroom hasn't displayed everything. Let me... I have no idea. This isn't up to date. <laughs> I've edited like a hundred or so images from here. I've been uh, going through and organizing um, all of my stuff lately. Here we go. Right. Um, cool. See, so yeah, I thought I'd lost the the whole library. I was having a little panic for the moment. Panic, <laughs> um, dripping sweat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Inhale, exhale. Inhale, yeah, that's it. Exhale. This is Stephanie's yoga from this morning. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. So throughout my um, my images, I'll go through um, all sorts of uh, adjustments on things. Um, but yeah, the tone curve is really where where you sort of like start to build the character of an image. Um, and then likewise in the camera calibration, um, there's a lot of sort of characteristics you can build in there. Um, but as a before and after, um, so here's an image, uh, just a guy on a scooter coming through and then after, so you can see there's, uh, some radial gradients applied in here, um, playing around with the shadows and a little bit of the warmth and the white balance and stuff. Um, but for the most part, there's no sort of, um, I guess, um, composite sort of digital artworking um, like you may see with, you know, bringing in other elements through Photoshop, for example. Um, Do you create any presets for these or we have someone asking? Uh, yeah, so I've, um, I do use presets and um, I have those available as well. Um, you can get those from my site. Um, and yeah, I've, I've kind of, again, on the efficiency side of things, the presets I created for me um, and they were a way to really streamline my workflow and just kind of build some consistency and character into, into what I was doing. And it's because of questions like that, people asking 
all the time um, that I ended up eventually releasing those. Um, so yeah, they are available. And I'm not sure why I can't browse by just my edited. So and uh, how is it when you uh, when you take pictures? Do you have special places uh, in mind that you want to go to and take a picture of? Or is it more out of the moment? You just walk around and you suddenly see something and then you just take a picture of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely um, an, uh, an explore, like what's around that corner type of photographer. Um, I have a, a general idea of the, um, the sort of locale that I want to be in. And quite often that revolves around Uh, food <laughs> so ellie is a, a massive foodie um and she's always researching and, and finding areas um for good food and i'm happily obliged on that um and then when we get there we both love um sort of like shooting around those busy areas and, and other things and generally where there's activity in which case the world lives by food um it's a good starting point for photography um, and from there, it's a case of just, you know, if we're looking at alleyways, for example, you know, just walking down streets and you just happen to look left and you think, oh, what's that? What's down there? Um, which is exactly the case for I just saw that this image was in my library. We weren't walking down this street. This is actually just a side street. And I snapped it, um, you know, stood still for maybe two seconds to take that image um, to catch those. Sometimes we maybe find a location where it's worth just standing for a few minutes to get the right person. So, for example, a scene like this, um, and then waiting for someone to enter um, to get the shot. But for the most part, it's it's just walking, just wandering and exploring, um, and yeah, just seeing various different scenes and following the light as it happens. We have a question actually, Lightroom versus Photoshop. Uh, for what would you recommend Photoshop and for what Lightroom? Uh, I would definitely stick with Lightroom um, if all you're looking to do is uh, manipulate the, uh, the photo aspect of an image. Um, so what whatever comes out of your camera in terms of um, the scene that you're looking at, if you want to be changing your colors, the transformation of your perspectives and just anything that is still seemingly a photograph at the end of it, then by all means organize and stick with Lightroom and your whole process is covered. If you wanted to start adding in extra elements from say other photos, so say you've got this image, for example, and you wanted to add something in here, um, say a photo mix the two you wanted to take this person but put her into this landscape image then that's where you start to need to use things like photoshop if you need to layer up um, various different um, imagery um, and artwork and assets that's what i mean by compositional uh, uh, composite photography so If you're looking to do those things, then Photoshop. Um, all of the raw capabilities in Lightroom, so in your develop module, these are based off of Adobe Camera Raw, which is equally usable in Photoshop. They're just a little bit more um, user-friendly in Lightroom because everything is, is organized and connected to your library, so you can skim through the images so much faster because you're not having to do the process of opening in an application saving, closing, and going through dialog boxes and things like that. Lightroom just speeds it up um, hugely. So yeah, if it's just photography, Lightroom will get you all the way there. And we have uh, someone else asking, which camera uh, would you recommend? Uh, any brand specific one would be good to know. Um, the best way is to really go and see one go and hold a camera and and use it i mean some brands are packed full of specs and on paper the the specs look you know immense there is every feature you could ask for but when you hold it and you use it and you realize that it's not quite it's not quite bringing that enjoyment in photography 
then you realize that the specs don't matter. Um, and if you're not using that camera, if you're not enjoying it in the same way, then that's the wrong camera for you. It may be the right one for someone else. Um, so there's no one brand or particular camera that I could recommend. Um, I personally shoot with Fujifilm and the cameras that I've had have brought out the most enjoyment for me in using them. Um, and one of the aspects I love is the dial based system. So everything's kind of all dials on top and on the lens and things. But some people hate that. Some people really don't enjoy that at all and they prefer to have it all completely digital. So uh, there's no real um, best camera to start with. The, the better way to look at it is how you invest in your equipment. Um, so the best investment you can make is on your lenses. Uh, if you're going to go for a camera with interchangeable lenses, because that's where the image brings out its sharpness, its character. It's that's where there's um, more emotion in the image is your choice of lens and the quality of that lens. Um, you'll quite often keep the same lenses through multiple generations of different camera bodies because they, they last so much longer and there's, there's just more value in them. So in terms of budget, I would almost look towards the lenses first um, to see what is available from the different brands and then see which system is uh, a good place for you to start looking at the camera bodies and what's on offer. We also have Tony in, in the jet. Hi, Tony. And Tony. speaking of Tony, <laughs> we have introduced every Friday fancy dress streams. So <laughs> my question to you, Joey, <laughs> what fancy dress do you have at home? <laughs> um, I used to have a, a banana suit. Um, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I had a banana suit for, for years and years. Um, And then it got put in storage and I think there was some moisture or something. I took it out one day and it, it kind of, it looked like it was starting to grow mold. And I thought, yeah, this, <laughs> this banana has go. gone off. So. <laughs> oh, no. I love that Stephanie throws the random question in the middle of a stream. <laughs> yeah, I just saw Tony and I was thinking of it. And we spoke about that before. We should ask our guests what would they wear on Fridays. <laughs> So this is the yeah, daily because, challenge. <laughs> yeah, because we we ask uh, we ask our viewers out there, our community, to also put on their fancy dress and post a picture on social media on Friday with the hashtag Fancy Friday Streams. <laughs> so maybe banana you, is pretty good so far. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to put on your banana one last time and post it, yeah. <laughs> revive it. <laughs> Friday is the day. <laughs> Right, Joe, back to the process, though. Yeah, yeah. back yeah. to your process. So. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, so, so there, that was a, a quick look into Lightroom. Um, yeah. Let's just head back into Premiere. So I want to share through, uh, so one of my, probably my favorite video um, that I worked on uh, is my, uh, it was the Made in Japan project. Um, I don't know if it's been, seen it's on my channel it's the the main um it's like the preview video that's that displays if you first arrive at the channel um so this was a a huge project um both logistically and in terms of the amount of footage and just the the real sort of goal for it um so this was a project with the ishikawa and gifu tourism boards in japan and um they were looking to show the craftsmanship of um, handcrafts, uh, traditional handcrafts from what is essentially the heartland of Japan. It's the it's where the the manufacturing industry is really sort of boomed. Um, and in typical Japanese fashion, there's so much, um, I guess, attention to detail and quality. Um, so we we had this trip to go and explore all these different areas. Um, And I wanted to make something really big from it. So we made this with an intention to get as close to it being a, a documentary as possible um, and share some of the information and just really bring out the passion and the love for craft. Um, and the, I think, yeah, just on the screen now, shocking in is the term for like an artisan. That's the, um, the size of it. So it's, um, yeah, it was a, a huge logistical plan but it was one that that went well it it went 
almost everything to plan except for the the very first day when um, I actually didn't make it to the country in time. I got stuck overnight in America. Um, but other than that, everything uh, everything went according to plan. And we made this this film, and it was a, a huge piece. Um, it turned out that every I'm time. Sorry. Oh, that's Siri talking to me. <laughs> um, it turned out that every time um, we had to publish a uh, like a review of the draft, we were on another trip. Um, so this was actually mostly edited on a plane. Um, and even when it came to doing the actual, like the voiceover and the talking of things, that all had to be done um a second time I actually sat in front of the camera and was talking through everything. It just didn't look right. The audio wasn't, didn't have the, the right emotion. So we completely changed path halfway through. Um, but the end result I'm, I'm hugely proud of. Um, so I got, yeah, if we switch on to my premiere, um, we can see how this is how the project looks. So again, from the very start, everything's all, neatly organized in the same way that my template was. Um, so even though I've not actually opened this for a number of months, I can already navigate my way through and remember where everything is. Uh, so all the different versions that we created, my way of working is generally to drop in a lot of the footage onto the timeline. We can see we've got about two hours worth of chosen footage. Um, and the goal was to make something around 25 minutes that was kind of the the length that I wanted to make um, and generally what I'll do is I'll oops premiere just crashed that's not a good sign classic <laughs> maybe we can <laughs> throw in a question in the meantime oops. yeah Stu Stuart is asking uh, is the video tone from the camera or a preset and he's saying he loves that style um, so it's a combination of them both um, so I uh, have set up a custom profile on my GH5. It's based upon Cine Like D, which is a fairly flat sort of profile. So the contrast is lowered, the saturation is lowered a little bit, but it's not as far as log footage, which um, is designed to capture uh, pretty much a very, very flat image. Um, so I, I've created a profile on the camera um, and then I have a series of LUTs that I've uh, been sort of tweaking and creating over the last two years or so. Um, and this project uses one of the sort of finalized versions of that. Um, so yeah, thanks for uh, for liking the color. I was um, I I also really enjoyed the the aesthetic that came from this video. Um, okay, so Premiere is back open. So uh yeah essentially what i'll do is i'll drop in all of my footage um from the camera and then i use markers on my timeline uh, and this way i can see where each of the different scenes um happens on the timeline so by selecting your sequence if you just tap an m uh you'll add a marker into your um uh, into your sequence and if you double tap onto it, you can add a title. So just test in here, increase some duration and even color code it if you want. And now we have this marker that's on the timeline in the, the timeline view. And it's also in the player um, the program view over here. So very quickly within my master timeline, which has all of the footage I'm potentially going to use in the final piece. I can tap through and I can jump to each of the scenes and find clips that I want to use. Um, and then what I did is from there, we went on and created um, further sequences and pulled the footage in. So you can see I actually then created a, a whole talking head scene, um, talking through all of this got scrapped. None of this made the final piece, including the audio. It was all completely scrapped. Um, and overlay various bits of uh, 
footage in over the, the audio. Um, this was actually filmed on an iPhone, this particular clip. So there's a mix of um, <laughs> there's a mix of uh, clips from different cameras, but for the most part, it's GH5, and maybe about five percent of it is shot on iPhone. Um, and this was the iPhone 11 Pro. Uh, it was the week that that came out. So you can see the raw clips here. But they're not raw, but the uh, the native clips are fairly flat in color. There's not much um, pop to them. And we have Paula who's asking if you've had any sort of legal issues with regards to image and media rights. Uh, not on... Um, not on this project. Um, I did have uh, a pretty big issue a couple of years back with some uh, some music. I've always been very careful of music licensing, and um, this is where it was a, a kind of a tricky thing because I got stung with a pretty big fine uh, from a licensing company because of where my channel is now. Um, I'm still a little bit bitter about it because at the time of starting my channel, it was very much a personal thing. So I used a personal license. Um, it ended up coming back to me um, a few years down the line where this company found my videos and they said, well, your channel is, is a business. And I was like, well, it is now. Um, and anyway, it was a, a long back and forth for months and months. And it just got to a point where I was so stressed about it that I was like it's it's costing me so much money being stressed on it it's not worth the fight anymore um and yeah that's that's the only sort of like big issue I've had in the past on things um I've never really spoken about that anywhere because it's it's a very independent thing it's it differs from from everyone um but in terms of image and video as long as you're respectful of where you are, if you're in a, a public place um, for the most part, so for example, in, in London, it's, um, uh, you know, you can film anywhere in a, in a public space. If you're on private land, um, it does depend on the, the land owner. And there's a lot of open spaces in London that you may not realize are actually private. And I've been uh, pretty much stopped every single time I'm trying to film somewhere like that. I think as soon as you have a microphone on the camera, it's noticeable that you're doing something a little more than just personal. Um, but for the most part, I, I've never really had any issues on those types of things. And we have James asking, where do you source your music now? So I've been using Musicbed uh, pretty much exclusively for the last few years. Um, they offer licensing uh, based on a subscription model. In fact, quite a lot of the um, the sort of music licensing places now, um, they've really upped to their game because of the growth on platforms such as YouTube, where people do need music that you can license for both personal and commercial work. Um, so similar to, say, like a, a Spotify or an Apple Music, you can pay a monthly fee and you have access to a whole library of really good quality audio and you can fine tune your search and you can get, um, you know, you can organize everything through projects and whatever. Um, and so often finding music is one of the hardest aspects of making a film. You can take hours and hours and sometimes you can find the right music and continue to search for no other reason other than thinking that there could be something better. <laughs> and yeah, if you're not careful, you're, you'll waste away your time finding music. Um, but yeah, music bed, great place. And James is asking for free music. If you have any tip there. Uh, reach out to artists on SoundCloud. Um, a lot of them are, are looking for collaboration. Um, you know, it's a kind of, it's a case of like um, helping each other. So just make sure you don't just take someone's music actually contact them and ask if you know set out your terms you're making a film about whatever um it's going to be published here on this date i can credit you and link to you know whatever you'd like me to um 
And if they're open to it, which a lot of them are, um, then great. If not, then just respect that and see if there's a way that you can purchase it from them or um, sometimes you don't hear back and that's just how it goes. But SoundCloud is a great place to, to just search. And uh, usually um, artists of a, a decent quality will put their contact details in their bio. Um, you can reach out to them. And how long did it take you, the, the editing that you just showed us in Premiere, how long did it take you in total to get to the final? And there was uh, a lot of back and forth and change, as you said. So. <laughs> yeah, this, so we filmed this in September and we published on Christmas Day. Um, and overall, I think there could be maybe... maybe about a hundred hours, something of editing, um, spread out over that time. Um, and a huge amount on just production and fact checking and planning and the logistics of, um, sort of travel. And yeah, there was a, a huge amount to that. Um, and with the edit itself, we split it in half. So Ellie, edited the um the first drafts for the first half of the film and i did the first drafts for the second half um, and then we merged our premiere files and we just brought the two sequences together and then from there um i fine-tuned it and and kind of processed it together and um we were collaboratively working on it but i was controlling the keyboard at that point we went on two separate files um, so, yeah, there is an element of, I guess, our time being efficient because there were two of us working on it. Um, but, yeah, it was definitely a, a pretty big project in the grand scheme of things compared to other videos on my channel. Looks um, like it, definitely. We have pretty much uh, come up to time. Um, is there any last thing you want to say to our community out there? Uh I think um, if I could leave with a, a message of, you know, just make things for yourself. Like the, the best way that I've always got to where I want to be in, in my work and creativity has always been to make the things that I want to see. Um, and there's only so much advice you can get from other people on, on what you can, um, what you can do and what you can make. So starting internally, I think just goes a, a really long way. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my biggest message. I just want to spread creativity for everyone for themselves, really. Well, we definitely had a lot of uh, questions in here, a lot of engagement from our community. Um, both Emma and I are here every day, Monday to Friday from noon to 1 p.m. with UK artists. And uh, thank you very, very much, Joey, for um, taking us uh, onto your journey and letting us travel virtually to Japan yeah. today in that one hour. <laughs> It's really interesting. I've never been to Japan. So um, really beautiful images and also how you explained Lightroom and um, yeah, really great having you in our stream and uh, also thank you very much emma for co-hosting with me is there anything you. you want to say as a last thanks word? Um, yeah thanks everyone for joining thanks joe really um i wish we could have covered more time flies is what everyone's saying in the chat as well um but it was just great having you and getting a bit of an insight into your world and thanks stephanie thank you all and see you tomorrow bye-bye see you tomorrow bye